So we are back to the maybe the most common to topic of this spy data, which is machine learning, more or less. More or less. More or less. And um, we will have Manuel Garrido that will talk about uh, recommendation systems. So an applause for. <clears throat> Hi, well, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Manuel, and I'm gonna talk about recommendation systems. Uh, first of all, a little bit about myself. I work as a data scientist at Scraping Hub. We are one of the sponsors. Uh, I was born in Portugal. I've lived in Spain most of my life, and I've spent the last four years in New York. In terms of my career path, I started as a consultant here in Madrid. Then I moved to an analyst position, and then I moved to a data scientist position. That means that I follow, in terms of tool set, a very useful, a very normal path, right? I started with Excel, then writing some BBA macros, fighting with it, then I discovered R, and I was mind blown. Then R didn't scale for some reasons, so I switched to Python, and I loved it. And now lately I'm working with very big data sets, so I'm using Spark a lot lately. That's my contact information. That's my personal website, and you can go there for two reasons. First, if you go, you will see a picture of my dog. And second, if you go to that, to that website and you do a slash by data, you get the slides for the talk, so in case you wanna check them out. And that's my Twitter handle, and those are my professional and personal emails. A little, uh, the, a little bit of my company. Uh, we are, the company was founded by the creators of Scrappy, which is probably the most famous tool for web scraping in Python. And we are specialized in extracting data from online sources. And we can help you or your company in many different ways. We have a super cool team of engineers that basically can extract data from any online source, literally any online source. We have a very big set of cool data sets that we sell and that I get to play with. And we also have, in terms of you like to do things on your own, we have a platform where you can deploy your code and then you can just run it by yourself. Most important of all, we are hiring. So if, like me, you like to play with massive data sets, just talk to me after the talk. We're a fully remote company, so you shouldn't have issues with that. A little bit about the talk, it's entry level. That means if you have some experience with recommendation systems, there is a slight chance that you learn nothing. Uh, it's gonna be focused on examples. That means if you wanna follow along, I don't see that many people with laptops, but if you want and you have pandas, about point in, uh, 17, and you have NumPy, or optionally SciPy, you can clone that repository, and then you can start a Jupyter Notebook, and you have all the code there, and so you can run it along. Uh, could you guys raise your hand if someone is gonna follow, because I will go slower. Okay, two, all right, cool. <laughs> so, can you guys start cloning that? So, it's also on the PyData repository. Cool, okay. So, what are recommendation systems? That's the basic Wikipedia definition. Uh, as per Wikipedia, recommendation systems are a subclass of information filtering system that seeks to predict the rating or the preference that a user will give to an item. I don't like that definition. For me, very simply, a recommendation system is basically a system that provides recommendations. And that's all you need. Okay? How do those systems provide recommendations? For that, you need information. And that information can come from a wide variety of sources. Most common ones would be information about the items themselves. For example, if the, is this shoe blue, or is it a sneaker, or is it a high heel shoe? Then you have also information about the users, right? You can tell, oh, who they are, how do they interact with my items, have they explicitly told me their preferences, who do they know? And then, and this is also very important, you have the platform information, things like stock, what's the stock you have of a certain item, item? Are some items, do they have expiration dates? Are there some business goals that you need to implement? All of these are sources of information that you can use and you should use to plug it into your recommendation system. This is a certain amount of similarity because nobody explains what similarity is on any talk. And it's very important. It's basically like the core concept of any recommendation system. And you might think, oh, I know what, when two things are, too simil are similar, but in terms of data science, similarity metrics, there are a wild variety of similarity metrics and some are used better to define similarity between certain entities. For example, if you are measuring similarity among strings, one common metric would be the Levenstein, the edit distance, which is very simple. It basically measures the changes you need to do to a string A, so it becomes a string B. For example, to turn rig into erc, you need to do three changes. You need to change three letters. 
Uh, that are common use metric would be the Jacquard index, which is very useful when you are measuring set similarity. For example, if you want to measure the similarity of two groups of friends, one way you can do it is you can measure the number of friends that are in both groups and divided by the number of friends that are in either one of the groups. That would be the Jacquard index. Then you have another set of common similarity matrix, which are basically distances. You have the Manhattan distance, which basically measures the distance between two points in right angles. Then you have the Euclidean one, which is basically the geometrical one that we have. We have two points, we just measure the straight distance. And then we have the cosine similarity, which measures the cosine of the angle between two vectors. There are many more, by the way. In terms of my recommendation systems approaches, there are many approaches. Most common ones would be content filtering, uh, collaboration filtering, then you have hybrid systems, and then you have the other, because you always need to have another in a list, basically. And I'm gonna talk mostly about the first two, uh, but now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the other. Uh, other, there are many other ways. You could create your own if you want to. But for example, demographic recommendations. Let's say you have a website and you are lucky enough that you have demographic information about your users. Then you can just classify those users into those strata, and then you can use that to recommend based on which strata a user belongs to. You can gather information yourself, or you can use research for that. And then you have social recommendations, which is something that everyone does nowadays. Like anytime you click the share button on a website and you are sharing it with someone, you are basically doing an explicit recommendation to someone you know. Let's talk a little bit about content filtering. Uh, content filtering is an uh, approach or re for recommendation systems where all the features are derived from the items themselves. That means that all the, all the information comes from the items, it doesn't come from the users. That doesn't mean that you don't need user input to recommend things, you need to know who they are. But that that info is only used at recommendation time, not the moment you are building the features themselves. One very clear example, maybe for those in the US, I don't know here, <laughs> it's Pandora. In case you don't know Pandora, which I wouldn't be surprised, it's basically the most popular radio, online radio in the US. And first time you join, since Pandora doesn't know anything about you, you see that. Right, you say, hey, tell me which songs, genres, or artists you like. And then Pandora uses that information to magically build an online radio for you. <laughs> and that online radio, the cool thing is you can continue adding songs or artists, and it will get to know you more. The more you add, the more it gets to know you, the more personalized the recommendations are. Pandora is based off the Music Genome Project, which is a project that claims to be the most in-depth taxonomy of music. Basically, Pandora has a team of musical analysts that Every month, they review 10,000 songs, 10,000 new songs, and then they map them into a set of 450 features. And then Pandora uses those features to provide recommendations. These are just some examples here on the left of, of features that they use. <laughs> and as you can see, they are like super specific. Right? You have things like subtle use of the harmonica. right? And those things make sense for us, so they are humanly, humanly interpretable, but they make way more sense for an expert. In terms of pros and cons of content filtering, big, big pros is that when you get a new user, you can recommend that user right away because the information you need is coming from the items themselves. So I can tell you, hey, which songs do you like? Oh, I like this, sure. I can recommend you right away. Another very good pron is that you can apply domain knowledge, right? Pandora has these experts that know more than anyone about music, so they can recommend better than us. A uh, big con is that you need to map every item into the whole feature space. So, for example, let's imagine that Pandora gets a new song, and it's a song that doesn't fit into those 450 features, but that it requires a very new feature because it's a very new style of music. Then the analyst would need to, A, add that feature, and then they need to, would need to map all the songs in Pandora to that feature. Uh, another con is that the recommendations are limited in scope because you are predefining them and they are based on the items. For example, who can assume that 450 are all the features that you need to recommend music. Maybe it's a thousand, maybe it's a million, we don't know. Now we're gonna do the first example, a practical example for the two guys <laughs> right here. So basically we're gonna build a very simple content filtering recommendation system, and it's gonna recommend movies. And we're gonna use the movie lens data set, which is, I think is released by the University of Michigan. Uh, it basically has like a massive amount of movie information on one table and ratings information about those movies on another table. So in this case, is content filtering. We're only gonna use the movie table. First, we import pandas and numpy, and we load the 
the movies table, which is very simple. It basically has the movie ID, the title, and the genres that that movie belongs to. The genres are defined as a string, with the genres separated by a pipe. So you have Toy Stories, animation, <laughs> pipe children's, pipe comedy. So first thing we do is we turn it into a set of dummy variables, splitting on the pipe. And then for each movie, we get a vector of zeros and ones, with ones being those categories or genres that movie belongs to. And that's how it looks. <laughs> then let's assume we have a user, and we know that that user has watched those movies. That user loves action movies, and sci-fi, and some children movies. That's all we know. How would we recommend new movies to this guy? First of all, we get that user's preferences, and we do this very simply in this example. <laughs> we basically get from all that movies table, we just get the slice of the movies that user has watched, and then we transpose it. That means that for that user, we get a set of rows, the categories of the movies, and then zeros and ones depending on which movie. Then we calculate the average by the category, and then we just get those numbers. We get that feature, which would be like 0 0.666, comma, 0 0.33, et cetera, and that's the feature of that user's preferences. In this case, we see, because of the movies he watched, that he likes action and adventure and some children, and he absolutely hates Western movies, for example. So now what we can do is, for that user, we can get the predicted score that that user would get, which is super simple. We basically get <laughs> that movie's features, which is just basically slicing on that movie, and we get that feature of series of ones, and then we do the dot product with that user preferences, and then we get a number. And that number by itself doesn't make much sense, but when we are comparing between movies, it gives us a very good idea of which movies he would like. For example, for this guy that liked, uh, that liked action movies and sci-fi, Terminator gets a higher score than Scream, because this guy didn't like horror movies that much. So how do we build our final recommendation system in this case? We basically just put all of the things we learned before, the get movie score function, and we basically, for a set of user preferences, which is that vector that we got from the user because of the movies he watched, we just iterate through all the movies, and then we compute the score, the predicted score for that movie. That would be the when you assign the score column. <laughs> and then basically, you just need to sort by that score, descending, and then you get on the top the ones that will get a higher score. And then you just return that data from. So in this case, because this guy likes action movies and sci-fi and so children, what do you get? You get Transformers because it's like action, animation, children, sci-fi. He gets everything he wants, right? And then you get Star Wars because he likes some of the Star Wars, things like that. The cool thing about this case is we started with movies that this guy had watched. But what if he was a new user and we knew no information about him? Well, one easy thing we can say is, hey, tell us which category you like. So you get a rating of one to five for each category, and then the user goes in the first time, similar to Pandora, and then he says, oh, I like action a lot, and I hate animation. So in this case, this guy is giving us the initial feature list for this, guy, for this user, He's giving us his preferences. And then we will do the same, and we'll get similar, similar recommendations. <laughs> uh, any questions? Are we good? Uh, good, good. Now we're gonna talk about collaborative filtering. And collaborative filtering is a more modern approach. I mean, some companies still use content filtering. And basically, in collaborative filtering, the features are not coming from the items, but they are coming from individual user information. So either like their behaviors or their attitudes. Basically, you are using how the users interact with your platform to create features to recommend. The cool thing about this is, Sadly, now you have like a very big massive data set of information to play with because you have all the user information. There are two basic approaches. One would be item to item collaborative filtering in which you measure similarity between items and then you recommend those items. And then you have user item collaborative filtering in which you get similar users and then you recommend the items from those users. That would be the thing you normally see like users like you bought this or read this. That would be item to user collaborative filtering. One example of item to item collaborative filtering would be Amazon of, I think, three years ago. <laughs> I think now they have changed completely. But, so basically, when you go to Amazon to an item page, you see at the bottom, users who bought this also bought X. <laughs> How Amazon started doing this is they basically calculate similarity between items purely based on which items were frequently bought together. 
So this is how Amazon set up their <laughs> pseudo, pseudo call for the algorithm. So basically for each item, then you go to each user who bought that item, and then you go to every other product that that user bought, and then you just record the intersection between the two as a pair purchase. And then you have that for all the items, so then to get the similarities with one item, just compute the similarity with the other items. And I think they use causing similarity at first for this. Sample, somehow example of user item collaborative filtering, it would be Facebook, even though they use a completely different approach, would be graph-based approach. <laughs> Basically, when you go to people you may know on Facebook, what does it do? It goes to your friends, and then it goes to your friends' friends, who aren't your friends, I recommend them as friends. And that makes sense. That really makes a lot of sense, right? It's just a lot of friends. <laughs> so that would be a user item because first it's going to the users. The pros and cons of collaborative filtering. <laughs> the pros would be that it can recommend new items without you having to map them manually, right? Because you are not caring about the items themselves. It's one very good pro is it doesn't is domain agnostic. You can just plug it to a website that sells potatoes or to a website that sells movies, and since you don't just care about the interaction between the users, it should work. <laughs> and that another good pro is that it can recommend based on hidden features. For example, if you're recommending movies and you use collaborative filtering, it won't recommend based on categories, which are humanly, humanly interpretable. They would, be, they would recommend probably based on combination of actors, on combination of certain scenes that certain set of movies have. And that's very hard to hard code by a human, for example. <laughs> a very big con is what is called the call the start problem, which is since you need information about the users to recommend, until you don't have information about the user, you can recommend, basically. And another issue is that since every interaction affects the features, you need to recompute these similarities much more often than with content filtering, for example. And now we're gonna go to another example. <laughs> In this case, we're gonna build a very simple recommendation engine for Reddit. <laughs> you can actually, this is a pet friend of mine, if you go to that site to find this out, you can go there, it will ask you authentication, it will get your subreddits, and then it will recommend some. <laughs> so in this case, is item to item, because we are gonna use information about the users to get similarities of the items, and then we'll recommend those items. Basically, we'll get a set of subreddits that our user will give us, and then we'll recommend similar subreddits to him or her. <laughs> in this case, in terms of similarity metric, we'll, we'll use the Jacquard index that I explained before. <laughs> So the union divided by uh, intersection of a set. And on that data set, the, on the repository, there was a compressed database that you should can zip to decompress it. It has all the data about this project. <laughs> Basically, that's, it's a very simple SQLite database that has two tables. It has the raters table and the similarity table. And the raters table is the most important one. It basically has one point eight million uh, comments with users, so it basically has two columns, the Redditor column and the subreddit, which is basically a registry of a user writing a message on a subreddit. <laughs> Very simple. How we would compute similarity based on this table? Since we said we're gonna use the Jacquard index, it's super easy. We do two queries per uh, combination of subreddits, and then we get, on the first one, we get the union. That means those users that wrote a message on both sub one and sub two, <laughs> Then we get the intersection, which is those users that wrote in either sub one or sub two. <laughs> if they have none in common, you return zero, but if they have, you just do the division, and that's all. So with this, we can just apply that to any subreddit that we have information about. So for example, aviation and flying, they have a Jacquard index between zero, uh, it has 0 0.1. Jacquard index goes between zero and one, by the way. <laughs> so this is not how I calculated the whole similarity table, but this is how you could do it. Basically, you load all the subs, and then, and then for every combination, then you just compute, you just call that function before, and then you store that on the database. This approach would take like days probably to run. I didn't do it that way, <laughs> so what I did, I just populated the table for you. So you have the, table, the similarity table with all the similarity between the top, I think, 10,000 subs. <laughs> so basically, we sort them by similarity. We get the most similar subreddits on that set and we see that they are basically clones of each other, right? You have like imaginary characters and imaginary monsters. It makes sense that they are among the most similar ones. <laughs> then you have like keto, which I think is a kind of diet, and keto recipes. So they are very similar subreddits. 
So how do we build the recommendation system with these similarities? It's very easy. Basically, for well, we build a utility function that gives us the subreddits for a user, and then given a redditor name uh, and the number of recommendations you want to provide, <laughs> it's very easy. We just go, and here I'm doing two queries because of how the similarity, it's not sorted always by the first one being the, the first one in, in terms of alphabetical order, but basically you just get those two reddits that the user has written to, and then you sum the similarity of the rest. So then you're getting a sum of similarity of the other subreddits based on those that that user wrote to. <laughs> and once you have all the sum, then you just, same thing as before, you just sort by the sending, and then you just return the data frame <laughs> with the number of recommendations that you want. So it would an example, and I don't know that guy, just, I like the name. So this user, he has, first we're printing the subreddits he wrote to, <laughs> and we see that this guy has a very, I would, say, like to that person, that he's a liberal, he's very interested in politics, because he has written to political discussion, as social science, moderate politics, as politics, uh, he's interested somehow in religion, because he has written to Islam and atheism, changed my view also. So when we recommend for him, what do we get? First one, we get a very liberal subreddit, which would be environment, but then we get a lot of politics related subreddit. <laughs> And those are subreddits that that user would probably like based on the subreddits that he wrote to. <laughs> uh, yeah, so basically all of that. Uh, that would be one example. And then I think I might have time to do all the examples. Maybe I'm going too fast. I don't know. Uh, am I going too fast? No? No. <laughs> cool. Then uh, let's do another example. We're going to do another collaborative filtering, but we're going to talk, we're going to use the same movie lens data set that we used before we loaded the movies table that had basically information about the movies, but now we're gonna use the ratings that users give to movies to get the features that they will use to recommend movies. <laughs> so basically first, we load the ratings table, uh, which is a very simple table. It has the user ID, the movie ID, the rating, and the timestamp that user assigned that rating. We don't care about the, the timestamp, so we delete that column. <laughs> and then we basically are merging with the movies table, so we get like the title. Instead of the movie ID, it's easier to, work, to show you here with the title. <laughs> you wouldn't need to do that in production. So basically, this is how the table looks. So you have the user ID, then the movie title, and the rating that the user gave. So first thing we do is we transpose it. We do a pivot table, so we get the user IDs as rows, and then the movie titles as columns, and then on each intersection, we get the rating. So move, uh, user ID one, movie title, Star Wars, whatever, this guy gave a five. <laughs> the problem with this is since there are 3,700 movies, this uh, matrix is super sparse. That means if a user has given, has assigned 100 ratings, that means you have 100 uh, values and 3,600 nulls. <laughs> One way to reduce this is by doing some simple data imputation. And what we do is for every movie, we remove the nulls with the average rating for that movie. Very simple. <laughs> And to reduce the user bias, we just for every row, for every user, we deduct the mean of that user. And we do this for one simple reason. Some users love to give fives. They give fives to everything. They love moving. <laughs> Some other users give ones because they are like jerks. You know what I mean? So you deduct the mean, and then you are reducing the bias. Or they are critics. That's how they are called, but yeah. <laughs> so that's how it looks, how the table looks after, <laughs> after normalizing this way. And the metric, the similarity metric we're gonna use in this case is the prism moment, uh, product moment correlation coefficient, PMCC. <laughs> and this is a very simple metric that given two vectors or points, uh, it measures the similarity between them with a value of minus one if they are completely inversely correlated. <laughs> that would be that one over there. Uh, zero if they are not correlated at all. Uh, and then one if they are completely correlated. To do so, we're gonna use NumPy's super cool CoreCoF function, which basically does this for you. It requires a matrix, <laughs> so we just get the, well, I guess it works with data frames. No, okay, it works with data frames, that's good. Uh, basically, we transpose it, because remember, the titles were as columns. <laughs> Since we wanna get similarity between movies, then we need to turn them as rows. So then we just transpose, and then we calculate the similarities between movies. This gives us a matrix that has basically pairs of movies, so now we get movies as columns, movies as field, as rows, and on each intersection, the PMCC for those two movies. <laughs> for the same movie, it's always one, 
of course, because they always correlated, <laughs> but that's what you get from these metrics. So now that we have the correlation metrics, how do we recommend? <laughs> it's very easy. First, you get the utility function that get the correlation from one movie, that given one movie idle, uh, title, you just get that row, the row of PMCC for that, for that movie. Uh, <laughs> and then to get similar movies, then you just set up a threshold. So you say, okay, I will consider similar movies, only those with a PMCC of 0 0.2 or above. So then you are your filter and you're just getting the most similar one. <laughs> For example, if you're gonna get the similar movies to Star Wars Episode 5, first of all, I'm not removing the same movie. I should have, but what is the most similar movie to Episode 4? Episode 4, of course. And, but then you have also Episode 5, Episode 6, and Indiana Jones because they are very similar movies. <laughs> if you do the same thing with Die Hard, well, you get the same Die Hard, Die Hard 2, Die Hard 3, Little Weapon, and Terminator. So we can see that this approach is giving us super similar movies just with one movie. <laughs> How do we recommend items to a user? How do we recommend movies? It's very simple. Basically, we set up first an empty array of zeros based on the length of the movies, so 3706, I think. <laughs> and then for each movie on that user's movies, we just get that row of PMCCs for that movie, and then we just sum. We continue summing, and at the end we get like a sum of those correlations. We assign that on a data frame column, and once again, we sort by descending and we return the top. <laughs> well, in this case, I return the whole data frame, but you could return just the top. So for example, we get sampled user 21, which is a very clear example of someone who just loves children movies and animation. I guess, I guess it's for someone, someone like a parent, a father or something that is just rating kids' movies, I don't know. So this guy really likes animation and children's movies. <laughs> so what, <laughs> I think I'm going very fast, I don't know. Uh, so if we apply this function to this user, what happens, we apply that function, and then since he liked animation and children movies, what do we get? We get basically all the Disney catalog here. So we had all the children and movies, and they are, most of them are comedy, <laughs> so musicals. So we get very good results for that guy. <laughs> and now I'm gonna talk a little bit about hybrid models, uh, which hybrid models, well, hybrid systems, are basically a way in which you can limit the cons of content filtering and collaborative filtering. Because remember, with content filtering, you get limited features, but you can't recommend right away. With collaborative filtering, you have the cold start problem, so you need some information to recommend. <laughs> so what you do is you can do basically first, when you know nothing about the user, you use content filtering, you just recommend. And the moment you get information about the user, then you start using collaborative filtering. Or at the end, you can just use a weighted model, a hybrid model that combines both to recommend. One clear example of this would be Netflix. Netflix, when you go to the site, <laughs> you see first you see the top, the top recommendations for me, for example, that would be based on collaborative filtering, but then when you select one item, you get similar items. So it has a combination of information about the content itself, but also information about which users watch what. Uh, a little bit about some libraries in Python. <laughs> All right, I started a little bit earlier. Uh, a little bit about libraries in Python. The one I like the most is Python Rexes. Then you have Crab, which I think is called Scikit Recommender. I don't know if that's official, but they follow the Scikit Learn API. Then you have, I checked LightFM, with, which was announced like three months ago, I think at PyData Amsterdam. So that looks pretty cool. I think they use some kind of is uh, singular value decomposition, but they use also the item metadata, not only the user ratings <laughs> for that. And I have a lot of time, so I was supposed to finish here, but I'm not gonna finish here. <laughs> I'm gonna do a bonus exercise, and we're gonna do <laughs> collaborative filtering by singular value decomposition, which it's simpler than it looks like. <laughs> so what is singular value decomposition, or SVD? Well, SVD is a matrix factorization method Basically, what it does is it turns one matrix into a product of matrices. So <laughs> given a uh, matrix A, which is n rows by the columns, the singular value decomposition could return three columns, <laughs> with U being the left singular vectors of that matrix, VT being the right singular ve vectors of that matrix, and sigma being a diagonal mat matrix, that means everything is zero except the diagonal, and the diagonal will have the eigenvalues of that matrix ranked from higher to smaller. <laughs> Uh, UVR orthogonal, and well, yeah, and sigma is diagonal. What are eigenvalues? Basically, it's hard to explain, but you would say 
one eigenvalue would be if the matrix multiplied by a non-zero vector would get the same value of that eigenvalue, which is a scalar multiplied by the matrix. So <laughs> the full SVD is quite computational intensive, but what you can do is you can say, okay, I don't care about the whole eigenvalues of that matrix, so just give me the top K. Since we know they are ranked, then we can say, okay, so give me like a smaller, <laughs> a smaller matrix that has, uh, has similar information, but it's quite smaller. So this is a way to perform dimensionality reduction. So you are getting a similar, not the same matrix, but that is much easier to deal with. One very good thing about this is, like we said with the matrix, with the matrix of users and ratings, the initial one is super sparse. You have mostly null values. By doing this, you just completely reduce that sparsity. <laughs> so we're gonna do the same thing. Well, I'm loading the movies again, just so we have it fresh. This was supposed to be a completely independent, a completely independent problem. Uh, we load the ratings. Once again, uh, this is the same as before. We are getting now a user index, since we're gonna do a matrix, and all the user IDs are not one-to-one. -one. There are some that are missing. So we just get the mapping, so then we can get the user, the user index on that matrix based on the user ID. <laughs> uh, so then we get the, we do the same thing with pivot, same as before. Now we're not using the titles, we're just using the IDs. And basically we turn, we get that data frame, which looks like that, which is super sparse, right? We have everything null, except user, I, user ID one, rated user ID, mover ID one with a five, for example. So here we're gonna do a different way of data imputation, and this comes from a pa paper that is very cool. It's, I think it's called Filling the Empty Gaps on a User Movie, on a User Item Matrix, <laughs> as the paper. So one approach they do to do data imputation and this kind of user movie ratings is they use that formula, basically. <laughs> they use a mixture mean where they assign an alpha to the user's average rating and a beta to, well, another alpha to the movie average rating, and then for each missing value, they add use. 0.452 by the user's average, and they sum 0.548 by the movie's average. <laughs> so that way we, this takes quite, quite some time for the guys trying to run. Basically, I didn't do it very well, just iterating through all the movies. <laughs> so it's doing quite a bit. So basically, you just get the ones that are null, you just remove them. Uh, that gives out the matrix that is uh, not normalized, but at least it has no missing values. <laughs> Then we normalize it because for any matrix factorization, any dimensionality reduction, you should, like PCA, you should uh, do some normalization. So we just <laughs> turn it into a matrix and then we reduce, the, we subtract the mean of that matrix. And <laughs> then what we get is now we're going to use uh, SVDS, which is the sparse method from SciPy for calculating singular value decomposition. This way, this doesn't give us the full SVD, it just gives us like I said, the, the top K eigenvalues. <laughs> so basically, SVDS returns the same three values that I explained on the matrix before. Uh, the problem is the diagonal matrix. <laughs> oh, shit, but here I have 15 minutes. <laughs> oh, that's why, okay. Okay, so now I'm gonna go super fast. So the diagonal matrix is written as a vector, so we need to turn it back into a diagonal matrix. That's why we iterate and we assign zeros. We're just basically converting into a diagonal matrix, and then we do the dot product, and then we get the uh, SVD, the, uh, the truncated SVD, as it's called, of matrix A. <laughs> it's called XLR, right? Uh, this is, that's how it looks, and it has the same shape as the original one. So it has the 6,000 user <laughs> and the 3,700 movies. And now the cool thing is, now if we're gonna get the predicted ratings for one user, since that, uh, that uh, matrix is holding similar information to the original one, then we just need to totally just get that vector of that user. And those would be the scores that the user would give you. So uh, if this user, well, one quick note, one quick note, I use K100, which is the number of eigenvalues that we wanna select. I mean, ideally you would test this a lot to get the optimal one that provides the best accuracy score. I use 100 for Anyway, so we get the same user as before, who, if you remember, he liked like, a lot of uh, animation and children, some comedies and adventures, but mostly animation, children, stuff. So basically, we do the same thing, but here we don't have to do anything. For that user, we just get that user ID using the index that we used before, and then we just recommend right away. 
because we have the whole table <laughs> with all the information. For you guys that have heard about the Netflix challenge, Netflix challenge was a contest that Netflix did in 2007 that uh, gave money to whoever beat their algorithm. And this was one of the main approaches that they did to, <laughs> to recommend back in the day. And um, thanks again. <laughs> That's my dog. <laughs> so we have some time, like seven minutes for questions. Yeah. Thanks. A very basic question. Um, how to handle very tricky uh, manual data entry? <laughs> I, I mean, if um, there is some misspelling, uh, can the Levenstein uh, or Jacquard index uh, uh, handle this, uh, or you need the wildcards? Um. So you are assuming if you are getting data straight from the user, and you are putting it into the into your data set itself. Well, you should never do that, right? You should first normalize, and then once you have the normalized data and you know that it looks right, then you put it into your system. So that could be done through other methods that, you know, like you said, string similarity would be a very similar one, fuzzy matching, you know. That, if you want, we can talk after the talk. More questions? Okay, so thanks again. <laughs> <And applause. laughs>